let's look at some of the different attacks on passwords. Um, there's some things called the dictionary attack, brute force attack, or a combination, what we call a hybrid attack. First of all, a dictionary attack. What is a dictionary attack? Uh, first of all, password is, is not a password in clear text in the file on your computer. It's a hash of the password. So a dictionary attack basically takes every word in the dictionary, creates a hash, and then compares that hash to the hash in the file on the computer. And if it gets a match, then it looks back at the word it used to create that hash, and it has your password. A brute force attack is just that. It tries all possible combinations in order to get your, ha get your hash or to create your password. A brute force attack will always succeed. Why? It literally tries all of those. It tries every possible combination. What are some of the things that you can do to mitigate those attacks? Well, first of all, the obvious one is don't use or don't send your passwords in clear text. Uh, don't use common words, dictionary words. And do your own attacks against the password file. Do the dictionary attack to identify those. There's some tools out there, Satan being one of them, that you can use to look at that. Password checkers that you can use, Cain and Abel, John the Ripper, that you can use to test your password file to see how secure they are. And identify those that are weak, and then simply change those. Now let's look at how you can assess some of the effectiveness of some of the other access controls that you might have out there. First of all, there needs to be some accountability. We need to make sure that the users are accountable for the actions that they take. How do you do that? <clears throat> you do that by logging the activity, then verifying the entries in the log to see that the security policies are being enforced and being followed. You look at those logs to see if there's any malicious activity. Is a user going after some files that they shouldn't be trying to access? Uh, <clears throat> you also use those log files as a preventative measure. Uh, when you do detect there's an attack or somebody trying to do a brute force attack against the password file as an example. And you can also use that log file uh, to, as an investigative tool if you want to follow a particular action and see everywhere every action that was taken against that data or against that object. Now what are the different types of auditing that we look at? We talk about real time, we talk about non-real time, we talk about the fact that a, a good environment would have both. First of all, real time. Those are intrusion detection systems. I've got an intrusion happening now. Classic example is, is the antivirus software. As soon as an antivirus comes in, email attachment and file comes in, the antivirus software picks that up and you know immediately, real time, you've got an intrusion. Non-real time auditing is the process of looking at those audit logs. It might be later that day, later that week, or, or even later that month. That's non-real time, but you are reviewing that logs. And if you have a well-protected environment, you're going to be doing both. You're going to have real time and near real time or non-real time looking at that audit data. <clears throat> so let's look at how we manage this whole access control process. How do we identify and access the life cycle, if you would, of access control? First of all, your organization has to decide which access control model they're going to implement, whether it's going to be DAC, MAC, RBAC, RUBAC, whatever they're going to use. You would expect to find that in the security policy. Then the technologies and the techniques that are going to support that model need to be identified and they need to be put in place. The standards need to be developed, the policies need to develop, the procedures need to be developed and put in place. And then the next question that you have to answer is how are we going to manage this? Are we going to manage it centrally? One central location is going to handle everything. That might work for a small organization, but when you get into a large organization, particularly multinational or international or even across many states, a centralized approach may not be the best solution for you and you may want to decentralize. You may only want to decentralize a portion of that too, something that we refer to as the hybrid approach, where let's say you centrally manage the network, but then for local printers, for local file shares, you centralize that at that particular location. So you might choose a hybrid approach for the management of that or for the administration of that. When we talk about the centralized access control, we have one entity, one location, 
that is making the decision with regarding access. Senior management has to decide. That has to be defined in the security policy. Data owner makes the ultimate decision. <clears throat> then senior management decides what they're going to have in place in order to support that. Are they going to use something like Radius or TACX, TACX Plus, or the new version of Radius Diameter as their centralized access control? In other words, you've got one location. That location is controlling access for everybody. Now let's look at Radius as an example. And don't be confused when you see remote authentication dial-in user service. Yes, this used to be around when modems were in place and serial line interface protocol was in place, but it's still in use today. It is a handshaking protocol that allows that Radius server to provide the authentication and authorization information to the network server, the Radius client. <clears throat> we dial in, we access that Radius server. That Radius server will contain a database of users and credentials, or that Radius server may have be configured to give you access to another LDAP, a lightweight direct access protocol server that has the credentials on it. For example, your Radius server could be configured to access Active Directory and Windows and provide that database of users and credentials. And then there needs to be communication between the Radius client and the server, and that communication needs to be protected. The user, the steps in Radius, the user initiates that point-to-point um, -point protocol authentication with the provider. Radius client then prompts the user for their credentials. User types in their user ID password. The Radius client then sends those credentials to the Radius server. That Radius server then checks those credentials either locally in its own database or against the, act, let's say, Active Directory database and then sends back either an accept, a reject, or it may send a challenge response back. And if successful, then Radius will allow the client access to the network so that you can get on the network and do whatever you want to. Cisco came out with their own proprietary protocol. They called it Terminal Access Controller Access Control System, or TACACS, T-A-C-A-C-S. <clears throat> now, I know the slide says T-A-C-A-S plus. Let's talk about both T-A-C-A-C-S and T-A-C-A-C-S plus. ACS, without the plus sign, was single factor authentication, one. Uh, everybody said, you know what, we need strong authentication, we need two factor authentication. So Cisco came out with TACX, T-A-C-A-C-S plus, or two factor authentication. Basically, you have the same thing as you did with Radius. You have an access server, you have a TACX server, the client signs on and is authenticated, and if the success authentication is successful, that the client is allowed to access the data remotely. And then we have Diameter. Diameter was a protocol that was designed as the replacement for or the next generation of Radius. Basically, Radius was limited to serial line interface protocol, SLIP, or pretty good, I'm sorry, point-to-point -point protocol for the dial-up modems. Um, we need to have a little bit more to that. So we came up with Diameter. In addition to that, we've added in PAP, CHAP and EAP, all of those still being used. Diameter, again, a pictorial representation, you have the same thing. Client connects to an internet service provider, that internet service provider connects to the diameter network, and then the credentials are authenticated, and then the client, PDA, laptop, whatever, is allowed to access the data over the internet. That was centralized administration. Now let's talk a little bit about decentralized administration. We need to give the local users control. Control needs to be closer to the actual people in the department, department managers. For example, if a data owner is a department manager and he wants to give someone in his department access to a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet or a presentation he wants to work on, he should be able to do that in a decentralized mode. The requests do not get processed by that centralized or you may say, you know, that's a good idea, but we really need to have both. We need to control, let's say, our network from a centralized point of view. We want one entity, one network administrator to, co to control that network access, those very critical network resources. But, you know, for the local files, for the local printers, 
we can decentralize that. We call that a, a hybrid access control administration. Basically, it looks like this. You've got one client centrally monitoring everything, centralized. You've got somebody that's decentralized, or you've got them combined where you have both in your access control administration, the hybrid approach. Okay, uh, remember we talked about the methodologies for access control, administrative, technical, and physical. With administrative, the methodologies are group membership, what group are you a member of, what time of day, what transaction. So from an administrative methodology, we can restrict access to data based on time of day. Payroll files are not accessed at Sunday morning at 3 a.m. time of day, or transaction type. You're not allowed to do a transaction type equivalent to deleting the database table. Administrative access control methodologies. Technical methodology include things like Active Directory services and the logical location. And physical is simply that. It's the physical location. Those are all methodologies for controlling access. Now let's talk about that technical layer of access control. What are the technical access, access controls? We've already mentioned directory services, but the way that you architect the network also can be an access control, and that's technical. The network access is a technical control, as is encryption. And let me point out one thing. Auditing is a technical access control. Make yourself a note. You'll see that again. Auditing is a technical access control. Audit logs are technical controls because that tracks activity of the users and systems. It's not preventative. It can't prevent someone from accessing it, but it helps an administrator, system administrator, understand how the access took place so in the future they can make changes. For directory services, there are different types. All of them X.500 or L.0 compatible. Um, network directory services, Active Directory, all of those are different types of directory services and all of those are technical controls. With directory services, ISO published their X.500, which is the lightweight directory access protocol, which basically adapts the directory to work over TCP IP. Now throughout the CISSP course, there are two ISO published X.5 standards that you need to know. This is the first one, X.500. We'll talk in cryptography about X.509, but let's don't confuse that here. LDAP is a hierarchical, hierarchical database. It's an inverted tree structure. Basically, it allows delegation of naming and maintaining that potentially global uniqueness. Let's look at it. If you go all the way out the limb, all the way to the leaf, you're going to get that distinguished name, which is unique. And that specified the root from, from the root of the tree all the way out to the leaf. Now, what's on the leaf? Name, location, phone numbers, email addresses, your digital certificate, your public key, uh, and what application, what data access you have. That's what's on the tree. Kind of looks like this. You've got a root, uh, then you've got a country, US, UK, you've got organizations within that, then within the organization you've got organizational units, and then within the organizational units, that's where you are. That's where your printer is. That's where your workstation is. Now, we talked earlier about network design, but let's take a look at some network architecture. Where you place firewalls, for example, you may have an internal network within your trusted network. Let's say that that's just for the top secret data. And you put a firewall in front of that top secret data portion of your network to block it. So basically what you're doing is you're architecting the network to control access. You put a DMZ in place. You put your bastion host, your servers that you've hardened, you've removed all the extra services and ports from, in a DMZ. You put a firewall in front of the DMZ. You put a firewall after the DMZ. How you architect the network is going to control who has access and who can get in. Okay, let's look at physical layer access control or the physical controls. Network segregation, perimeter security, computer controls, work area separation or cabling. Network segregation is just that. You can physically separate the network. Or you can logically separate the network. Physically separate it so that the, the wiring, one set of routers, one set of switches, 
physically separated from other parts of the network or logically with virtual LANs. With perimeter security, you've got this, that. Locks on the doors, man traps to get into the building, guards, all of those are physical security controls. Computer controls, um, Faraday cages around sensitive or top secret equipment so that you don't get emanation. Um, computer controls like a lock on your laptop so that you lock it to your desk so people can't walk off on it with it. Um, for those of you that are under the requirement that you can't use the USB ports, uh, physically removing them from the device or uh, putting epoxy into that so you can't put a USB device into that slot because the slot's been filled up with epoxy. Those are all types of computer controls. And then work area separation. I have one client, uh, a state agency, who has uh, direct connection with a federal agency. They're both in the same physical building on the same floor. But you have to go through the state agency to get to the back of the room to another private door that only the federal employees are allowed to go through. And they have their own internal man trap in order to get into the federal area. To me, that's work area separation. And then cabling, actually keeping the cables separate. Those are all types of physical layer or physical controls. Network segregation, we talked about that. You can have physical or you can have logical, a virtual LAN, let's say, for top secret, a virtual for secret, and then a virtual for public information or for unclassified data. That is going to conclude this lecture on access control. So let me back up for a second. We've talked about access control as being the first line of defense. We've talked about how subjects, people, access objects, data, and the resources that go along to make that happen. The main goal is to protect resource from unauthorized access. The models, discretionary access control, mandatory access control, role-based access control, and rule-based access control. And then whether you want to manage access control either centrally or decentralized or whether you want to use a hybrid approach. We talked about the fact that controls can be administrative, physical, or technical controls, and that regardless of whether they're administrative, physical, or technical, those controls can give you preventative, detective, and recovery services. I hope you've enjoyed this module on access control, and I look forward to seeing you again. Get ready for telecommunications because that's the next module. Have a great day.